One of the primary goals of sixth grade science is for students to be able to do science. By that I mean they should be able to take a question posed by their teachers or by themselves and conduct a hands-on investigation to answer the question. This may sound simple, but science has a lot of rules regarding how to have a fair and accurate scientific investigation. You also need data to support any conclusions you make during this investigation. That's right. These rules, which we will call science and engineering practices, can be broken into three categories. Practices needed before conducting an investigation, practices needed during an investigation, and practices needed after an investigation. The first step is finding a testable scientific question and figuring out whether sixth graders can conduct a hands-on investigation to test that question. Consider the following questions. Which qualify as appropriate for sixth graders to answer scientifically doing a hands-on classroom investigation? What length pendulums have the greatest frequency? Is it okay for teachers to hand out candy for rewards? If two black holes collide, what would happen? Question two is not a scientific question. It's more of an opinion question. Question three is a scientific question, and although students could research possible answers to it online, black holes cannot be explored via classroom hands-on investigations. So question one is the appropriate question for sixth graders to investigate in the classroom. Once you've identified an appropriate question to investigate, what other practices must you consider before beginning an investigation? Begin by planning how you will carry out your investigation. Consider necessary materials. Are there any safety concerns, potentially hazardous chemicals, danger of getting burned, any time during which safety goggles should be worn? Safety during investigations is vitally important. Once you've planned your investigation, identified materials necessary, and considered all safety precautions, there's still one final task before you can begin. In most cases, you'll be taking measurements to help answer your question. At this time, you should create a data table to record the information in. If you need help creating data tables, click on the following link. Once you've completed the practices needed before conducting an investigation, you are ready to begin your investigation. What practices must you consider during your investigation? How about the following? Accurate measurement with proper tool, careful observation, recognition and control of variables, change only one at a time, recording data in proper table, actually carrying out the safety precautions you identified during your planning, and noting any sources of error during your investigation. Congratulations, you've properly planned and carried out your investigation. You're basically done, right? Actually, no. In many ways, the most difficult part of your investigation takes place after the investigation. Now you must analyze your data and draw appropriate conclusions. In many cases, to really make sense of the data you've collected, you need to create a graph. Graphs are visual representations of data. If you need more review on how to create a graph, click on the following link. After you state your conclusions based on your data, you are finished with your investigation. In most cases, however, your investigation may lead you to other questions, and that's what makes science so fascinating. There is never an end to the intriguing questions that you can explore. We hope this video has helped students and parents understand the vitally important goal of having students answer questions scientifically through hands-on investigations. But before we end, we'd like to make one final point. I was asking my students one year if they understood the importance of student-designed investigations, and I was very surprised by the answer I got from one of my students. She said she understood why it would be important to be able to know how to do these if you went into science for a living, but for a non-scientist, she wasn't sure that she really saw this as being an important skill. So let's consider when a non-scientist would want to use these science and engineering practices. Mr. Stith, I know you shared with me that your friend was having some stomach problems and his doctor recommended that he should take some antibiotics. That's true, but he wanted to avoid antibiotics if he could. So what he did is he started creating a food journal in which he wrote down everything he ate um, for several days. And he stuck with very bland food and water 
and after maybe four or five days, the problem went away. So what did he do next? Because surely he didn't want to just eat bland food and drink water the rest of his life. That's true. So he started adding different foods to his diet, but then the symptoms returned, and of course he didn't know which food to blame. Since your friend added back in several foods at once, he then couldn't tell which was the problem food. In any scientific experiment, you can only change one variable at a time. That way, you can identify the variable as causing the change. Yes, by adding one food at a time, he could identify it as safe or causing a problem. There are other kinds of medical-related issues where folks might want to conduct science investigations to try to figure out what might be the cause. And I know of several uh, situations where, where friends um, suddenly developed an allergic reaction to something and they started testing different um, changes to their diet and, and uh, other kind of changes. And I remember uh, shaving cream brand and laundry detergents as being causes of these problems. So many situations where you might want to try to figure out what would be a variable and a cause in your own life. We are not saying do these scientific experiments in place of medical advice. What we're saying is doing a scientific investigation in your own life in addition to seeking medical care can help you identify variables that are causing changes. I can think of another really good real world example. My friend bought a car and when she bought the car the seatbelt kept sticking. So she took it back to the dealership, but then as soon as she took it back, it worked. That was the way. So let me guess, she started to conduct her own investigation. She did. My friend began making really careful notes about when the seatbelt did and did not work. And at first she thought it was related to how long the car had been running. But upon further investigation into that theory, she found it didn't work. Once she was able to figure out that it wasn't related to how long the car had been running, she again kept tracking data. And what she figured out is that the seat belt didn't work in certain temperatures. Once she had this data, she was able to take it back to the dealership, and this made sense to their service department, and they were able to replace the malfunctioning part, and she was able to have a working seat belt again. We hope these examples better help you appreciate how understanding how to conduct fair scientific investigations can be useful for even the non-scientist. In addition, you now have the ability to think critically, and when you hear somebody make an amazing claim about something, you can look at the methods that they used and see if they have scientifically supported their claim with data.